All right, I think I'm going to get started for our next speaker in the Cabildo series, who is um, Professor Danielle Tarasas Williams. And um, so I am Nicole von Germanton. I'm the director of the School of History, Philosophy, and Religious Studies. And if you have any questions at all about this series or today's speaker, feel free to contact me at this email that you can see there. Um, this is a series that's been put on for this entire year since early fall um, and uh, supported by donors to the history department. Um, so our sixth speaker out of 10 this year. Um, and we, we've been talking today if we wanted to continue this next year. So we'd certainly be interested to hear if you'd like to, um, like to see more speakers next year in the same sort of tr uh, tradition that we've been starting this year. Um, and after this, um, after Professor Tarasas Williams finishes, um, we'll have a Q and A, and then I'll just briefly um, show our upcoming speakers in spring. Okay, so to talk about our excellent speaker today, Professor Danielle Tarasas Williams is an assistant professor of history at Oberlin College. She earned her PhD from Duke. She was also a uh, postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for African American Studies at Princeton, as well as the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell. She currently is working on a project, which is, I, I believe, probably somewhat of the uh, somewhat of the subject for today. Uh, and her book project is called "The Capital of Free Women: Legitimacy." Oh, sorry, race, legitimacy, and liberty in colonial Mexico. And um, we're really grateful for the audience and we're really grateful for Professor Tarasas Williams. Um, so we'll welcome her now and then we'll be very happy to take questions after her formal presentation. So thank you, Professor Tarasas Williams and thanks to the audience. All right. So first I'd like to thank uh, Professor Nicole von Germanton for this invitation to present in this series. It's also a wonderful opportunity for me to share with you some of my work on the history of Black women in colonial Mexico, perhaps especially it's um, a wonderful invitation to do this during Black History Month. So thank you very much for that. And for everyone's attendance today, I know it's a Friday um, in the afternoon, so thank you so much for the support. My talk will focus on the gendered history of freedom in the 17th century, underscore my interest in how Black women negotiated Spanish institutions, and highlight my investment in writing the history of people. My broader research explores social history by focusing on how, when, and why people made the choices they did as institutions attempted to circumscribe their options. When a Spanish royal magistrate decreed laws to affirm the rights of slave owners, for example, he likely never imagined that in 1661, a free black woman named Catalina de Morales in Jalapa, Veracruz would use the same legal protection to free her two enslaved daughters. In his last will and testament, Spanish slave owner Juan de Vera Betancourt donated Catalina's children to a convent nearly 200 kilometers away. However, he stipulated that if the convent refused the presence of the two girls, then both would be granted their freedom. As it turned out, the girls were rejected and Catalina marched into the office of the notary public in Jalapa and demanded that the executors of Juan's estate legally acknowledge that a slave owner had the right to determine what happened with his own property. Catalina had declared that slave owners held absolute authority, but this rhetorical performance safeguarded her children from further enslavement. My forthcoming book entitled The Capital of Free Women, Race, Legitimacy, and Liberty in Colonial Mexico examines how women like Catalina negotiated Spanish institutions as they confronted the cruel realities of slavery and fought for their dignity. The majority of enslaved Black people transported to Mexico first disembarked at the port of Veracruz and then forced into the interior via the Camino Real. This early modern highway linked the port of Veracruz and Mexico City, which facilitated the greater contact between the vice regal capital, regional hubs, and the greater Atlantic. These crown sponsored roads intertwine the legacies of the central Veracruz region, principally defined as the port of Veracruz, Jalapa, Córdoba, and Orizaba. However, the most frequent and substantive contact in the region was between the port and the town of Jalapa. 
People from the port of Veracruz often had family members, land, and businesses in Jalapa. Some free Black women and men even own homes in both places. For many in the region, Veracruz rep represented Atlantic commercial activities, while Jalapa represented a haven. Jalapa's economy depended on this relationship as it served as a way station town for merchants who wanted to escape the extreme weather, noxious mosquitoes, and the rampant outbreaks of yellow fever in the port of Veracruz. The town also served as the temporary home for soldiers and sailors awaiting orders to depart for the Caribbean or Spain. Jalapa even hosted newly arrived viceroys and other crown officials as they made their way on the Royal Road to Mexico City. So while Veracruz was the principal port of entry, it was not the heart of regional activity. For centuries, Jalapa endured as the preferred site of permanent, periodic, and temporary living, making the town far more Atlantic than one might expect. In many ways, Jalapa's population was Veracruz's population. And Jalapa's more fixed population consisted of its founding indigenous groups, Spaniards, mestizos, free and enslaved people of African descent, along with the sporadic appearance of subjects from Spain's global network, including people from Goa and the Philippines. Throughout the 17th century, the population in the greater jurisdiction of Jalapa fluctuated between about 1100 in the early 1600s and nearly 4,000 by the end of the 17th century, with indigenous people accounting for um, sometimes half and um, other times upwards of three quarters of that number, but most of them lived in the greater agricultural periphery of the town. The enslaved population in Jalapa included people of African descent and those from West and West Central Africa, specifically in the Atlantic islands. Most notorial entries cited Angola as a place of origin, but also nearly three dozen other locations. Most crucial to the history that I'm offering today was that Veracruz was not an area of the colony on the verge of divesting itself from slavery and black women in Jalapa and Veracruz throughout the 17th century were not representative. In fact, slavery was having a resurgence elsewhere in the region in Córdoba, a Spanish town settled in 1618 to serve as a maroon deterrent on the Royal Road, ensuring that merchants with costly cargo, a stable haven in the heart of maroon territory. Slave revolts, the growth in maroon communities, and the deepening of slavery in the region offer critical context for understanding the life choices and chances of free Black women of means in the central Veracruz region. And to clarify, not all Black women of means owned houses and dowered their daughters, although some certainly did. Drawing from Pierre Bado's definition of capital, my work employs the term as he asserts to reintroduce in all its forms capital and not solely in one form recognized by economic theory. For 17th century Black women, their social capital, their networks included local, regional, and even colony-wide power players, such as influential landowners, regional slave sellers, parish priests, and judges. Free women also amply demonstrated their cultural capital, their know-how, by documenting their knowledge of legal processes, rhetorical devices, and the importance of a religiously grounded identity. The breadth of their economic capital varied, which is why I use the term women of means rather than the more delineating term of women with wealth. For women of, e for women of means who lacked economic capital, for example, many still had cultural and social capital to mobilize. But how many women became of means is not always clear from their notorial footprint. In fact, how and when some women gained their freedom is not clear at all. From 1580 until 1730, the notorial archives of the region bore witness to the dynamic lives of black women. Some were indisputably wealthy and others had so little capital that they barely registered on the archival radar. And not unlike black women of means in other areas of the Americas and the Caribbean during the 18th and 19th centuries, free black women in 17th century Mexico accomplished similar feats of capital management through the acquisition of land, businesses, and profitable family ties, but nearly 100 years prior. Significantly, free black women in 17th century central Veracruz were not living in the wake of Taki's 1760 rebellion the triumph of the Haitian Revolution in 1804, 
or the 1878 labor rebellion known as Fireburn, led by three black women known as Queen Mary, Queen Agnes, and Queen Matilda, who organized the destruction of 50 plantations in Danish St. Croix. To be sure, enslaved people in Veracruz did rebel and took to, the uh, took to the advantage of the mountainous valleys along the Camino Real to liberate themselves, some forming smaller bands with a few larger settlements. In 1606 alone, for example, reports of slave rebellions in four different towns in the region struck fear among Spanish plantation owners who relied on both indigenous and enslaved African labor. Free Black women in central Veracruz did not live in a time of the Atlantic's most spectacular revolutionary moments. The end of slavery was not in sight. There were no queens who burned down an entire economy. No common wind had yet gusted past their coastlines. They lived in a region where sugar was king and where slave traders from the port of Veracruz regularly strolled the streets of their town with people who looked like them in shackles. For more than 150 years, free black women shaped the central Veracruz region of colonial Mexico through their expertise as property owners, proprietors, patrons, matriarchs, and as slave owners. And some of these women were also just one generation removed from slavery. As free women, how could they ensure their rights were recognized? How could they protect their interests? Who would believe them if they needed to dispute a business arrangement. Wisely not trusting verbal agreements or informal promissory notes, free black women in Veracruz sought out the legitimizing apparatus of the notary public. Some women likely strode confidently into the office, eager to sit across a notarial assistant to affirm a purchase or a sale. Others perhaps slowed their pace as they walked down the Royal Road to document their family's fissures and misfortunes. A survey of their cases establishes that black women employed similar strategies to other colonial subjects when dealing with this royal apparatus. But they also had uniquely gendered and racialized experiences, such as having their marriages questioned or having enslaved family members. Over and over, notaries scribbled near the conclusion of their documents that these same women, quote, did not sign their names because they did not know how. On April 22nd, 1610, Maria Lopez, a free black woman from Jalapa, notarized an agreement with Veracruz Port resident Francisco Hernandez Franco. Maria sold to Francisco a 25 year old enslaved woman also named Maria from the nation of Angola for 325 pesos, more than five times the amount of a standard plot of land sold in Jalapa. Maria Lopez did not know how to sign her name but like many other free women, she knew to turn to the power of the notorial office to produce the documents that legally acknowledged her rights. Once the notary graced the papers with his signature, which officially declared that he believed the statements therein to be true, so it was. So who would believe free black women? If the notary did, few others would matter. To consider what capital meant for marginalized people, I offer you the history of a spectacular event, the aftermath and its future uses by diverse subjects to underscore the vulnerability and resiliency of black women in slave societies. In my talk entitled, Who Dared to Question the Word of a Priest, Free Black Women and Social Capital in 17th Century Mexico. In the early hours of May 18th, 1683, a wave of violence unfolding on the shores of Veracruz awoke the residents of the sweltering port. By daybreak, some would bear witness and others would fall to the greatest assault against 17th century Mexico. A Dutchman named Luan Sugoff had planned and executed this bloody invasion of the city, held hundreds of people captive and left the port of Veracruz in shambles. It was an event with hemispheric implications for colonists, the crown, and the church. Two years later, a free black woman named Maria de la Candelaria testified before a notary public in Veracruz. In proceedings that sought to establish her rights to her husband's estate, we learn of the reach of Laurent de Goff's terror. Maria's daughter, also named Maria, along with hundreds of other black people had been, quote, 
taken prisoner by the enemy. For nearly two weeks, Laurent Sagroff and more than 800 pirates held Mexico's most important port of entry hostage. Few events outside of war and the most devastating natural disasters generate a collective memory that marks time across a diverse spectrum of society. The 1683 Great Siege was one such event. In its aftermath, vice regal officials, regional judges, city council members, and yes, even a wealthy free black woman called upon the memory of this devastating pirate attack. Some invoked the great siege to justify their decisions, reap new opportunities, or to generate sympathy. By invoking the memory of this trauma, Maria de la Candelaria and her family insisted on their experience as victims, like many others, still reeling from the unthinkable. In 1684, the Veracruz City Council offered its official report on the 1683 attack. It reads, they took our families and jailed them in the parish church where we were imprisoned with 4,000 people, men, women, priests, children, and black slaves. That is to say no one was spared regardless of gender, religious position, age, race, or legal status. The great siege document lost, but it also highlighted how Spanish authorities imagined the impact on the port's community, which was distinctly bereft of care for the most marginalized. In their report, the city council indicated their level of quote unquote concern for the hundreds of black people captured or killed by stating, not only did the great siege create a great need for labor in this city, but these people also used to pay taxes to your majesty. The shortage of workers and revenue and its effect on city planning was the primary point of distress for the crown. Black women and men are rendered an abstraction of colonial inconvenience, the loss of productivity and capital, not people, not members of a collective. The council report also noted that the pirates had abducted 1,500 enslaved people and 400, quote, poor and miserable free Black women. This description seems to have opened up space for Black women to be acknowledged as victims who had suffered a specific tragedy. That pirates deprived free Black women of their liberty was perhaps even shocking for the council members. However, officials said little else about the trauma of black women. Instead, they turned their sympathies to Spanish women. The city officials stated that the pirates forced the hostages from the church to march and carry supplies like animales cargados, pack animals, adding that at 11 in the morning, they took us, but left the mujeres blancas, the white women in the church. With bandits still roaming the street and pillaging homes, these white women were likely not safer in the church, but the pirates did not force them to carry supplies like animals. The council offered no further elaboration on the fate of these white women, but by signaling their experience, they also silenced the racialized and gendered experiences of the non-Spanish women as Laurent de Graff terrorized the port's residents. This silence is especially disturbing given what the council revealed next. Of those forced out of the church, the report stated that more than 50 people lost their lives in this deadly march, including people who drowned in river crossings and others who died from exhaustion. The city council members do not specify the race or gender of these 50 people, but their larger report clearly emphasized religion, the interests of the secular government, the importance of Spanish womanhood and the otherness of poor and miserable black women. Through graphic allusions and tragic references, slavery and black people were always central to the history of the great siege, but not always as victims. Near the end of the siege, free black men helped drive the pirates out of the city. The city council wrote, the enemies were exhausted from the many attacks against the fort and against some mulatos who were on horseback who found themselves unsupervised, but killing some of the pirates who were leaving the city. The mulatos killed about 50 of them, forcing the pirates to flee. So while black men took up arms against the foreign invaders, an air of suspicion remained. 
unsupervised these brave free black men were. And if they risked their lives in a city and on the shores where the majority of enslaved Africans would enter colonial Mexico. And perhaps they risked their lives because it was their duty. The fort was often manned by black militiamen. Or perhaps these black men rallied as they witnessed pirates abusing and rounding up members of their own community. In addition to the nearly 2000 people captured, the pirates fled from their final stand at Isla de Sacrificios, an island near the port, and captured an additional 100 people, black women and men, free and enslaved. So while the Spanish residents of the port had doors broken in and windows busted out, black people's lives were at stake on all the registers that made them both vulnerable and necessary in a slave society. And at least one of these ill-fated women was the daughter of Maria de la Candelaria, the widowed matriarch of an elite black family. Maria de la Candelaria was from Veracruz port, but had long established ties to Jalapa through her wealthy free black husband, Diego Ordonez. Tragically, he passed away at some point before 1682, and it was his death that precipitated Maria's entree onto the historical stage. In 1685, Maria was forced to subject herself her family and members of her community to the humiliating process of proving the legitimacy of her marriage in order to settle an inheritance dispute. Importantly, Maria asserted time and again that all of her children were born legitimately. With her son Joseph accompanying her, Maria testified, we appear here to establish and ascertain that between me, Maria de la Candelaria and Diego Ordonez, my deceased husband, we had and procreated legitimate children, Francisca, Juana, Maria, Mariana, and the aforementioned Joseph. And as legitimate children, any money or goods that may have been left by Diego correspond and belong to them. The statement concludes with, we ask for justice in this matter. And part of my interest in this history is imagining what justice might have looked like for black women in the colonial period. For free black women in Veracruz, justice might have meant at least having the chance to be viewed as legitimate members of society. Maria de la Candelaria fought for just that through the mobilization of her expansive social capital. What followed was tantamount to a procession of character witnesses, all attesting that Maria was the lawful wife of Diego and that all of their children were legitimate. One of their witnesses was a free black man named Francisco Maldonado, who testified that he had known the couple for more than 30 years, declaring that he saw them legitimately married in the city and that during their marriage, he saw them have their children. He then named all five children and stated that Diego always recognized, raised and nurtured them. And that was the truth. The following witness called to testify was another free black man named Manuel de Ortega. He too corroborated that he had known Maria and Diego and that all five children were conceived during their marriage. While both men testified that they had known Maria and Diego as a married couple and watched them care for their children, neither man stated that he had served as an official witness in their marriage application, nor did either serve as the godfather of any of the five kids, which might have denoted a closer familiarity with the free black couple. However, as both men claimed to be vecinos, uh, affirming their long relationship to the city, they implied that they would have known if a wealthy couple like Maria and Diego had not been legitimately married. The notary and likely Maria and her son Joseph must have understood the potential ambiguity of these statements and calculated the need for someone who could offer a more absolute narrative. The third witness was Licenciado Don Juan Sanchez de Tovar, a priest who declared, I knew that Maria and Diego were married according to the order of our holy church and as such, they had legitimate children. After the priest named all five children, he added that Joseph was present in Veracruz, Mariana was in Mexico City, and when he cited Maria, he added, who was taken prisoner 
by the enemy. Maria de la Candelaria had provided an unassailable witness who, for example, dared to question the word of a priest. One month after presenting her case, Maria's son Joseph registered a final entry on his mother's behalf. So while not a letter verifying that Maria was the lawful wife of Diego, Joseph's assertion of his family's legitimacy resonate throughout the document and imply that Maria's campaign was perhaps successful. Joseph's statement reads, I, Joseph Ordonez, am the legitimate son of Diego Ordonez and Maria de la Candelaria. I am the heir of my father and the legal proxy of my mother, who is the guardian administrator of the other heirs of my aforementioned deceased father, Diego Ordonez. Joseph then noted that he had sold a significant combination of his father's property in the greater jurisdiction of Jalapa, that he was able to transact this sale for Maria and exert some control over the inheritance implies that the officials who had examined Maria's case had sided with the wealthy black widow, at least partially perhaps. As his mother's representative, Joseph sold two grazing areas for smaller animals. The first measured three acres and the second measured two acres and had the advantage of being located near a river. And although a few acres of land does not sound particularly impressive, Maria sold them for a windfall of 400 pesos, 10 times the price of most other plots of land in the area. Maria's diligence in her presentation of her family's narrative paid off not only because she was confirmed as the legitimate wife of Diego, but as is now clear, she had a lot to gain financially in securing the inheritance rights to high value real estate. The final entry also clarifies how Maria's husband came into possession of these lands. The March 30th, 1685 documents cited only that a woman named Doña Luisa Ordonez had given Diego such properties. However, the April 26th, 1685 bill of sale specified that Doña Luisa was Diego's wealthy and generous aunt originally from Palm Island, but who was never identified by race. Diego had in, inherited the property in 1638 when he was just 10 years old, decades before his marriage to Maria, emphasizing the value of her husband's own social capital through family ties. Doña Luisa and her husband Manuel Rodriguez de Maya had long been fixtures in Jalapa, owning property in the region valued at 3,500 pesos as early as 1598 and owning slaves in the early 1600s before establishing a transportation business in the 1620s. When Manuel passed away in 1625, Doña Luisa continued to conduct business on her own, selling some of her land and continuing to own slaves. The additional information regarding Doña Luisa Ordonez's background suggests that Maria de la Candelaria might have needed a carefully curated narrative with a whole team of representatives and witnesses to prove her claim. The Spanish legal system allowed for the acknowledgement of natural children, children born out of wedlock, if the father so chose to grant such inheritance rights. And the same could be done for female consorts. However, under Spanish colonial inheritance laws, if Maria successfully defended her position as the legitimate wife of Diego, then she would have had the right to half of his estate with the other half evenly distributed among legitimate heirs. In addition to the financial benefits she would have received, it likely mattered quite a bit to this black woman of means that she set the record straight regarding the legitimacy of her family. Maria assembled an infallible defensive line against the accusation of her illegitimacy with three witnesses, one a clergyman to assert her marital, but also classed status. Although more widely documented among the Spanish elite, mothers and fathers rebutted claims that they conceived children out of wedlock to ensure their progeny would continue to ensure the material and social benefits ascribed to legitimacy. Maria de la Candelaria attempted to affirm her family's place in the social order and defend a position not outrightly presumed to be the domain of even a wealthier black woman. Whether black women were legitimate wives or quote unquote illegitimate life partners, the men's families likely did not welcome the inheritance cases of free negras, morenas, mulatas, and pardas. Maria's approach 
highlights her awareness of the weight accorded to gendered prescriptions, perhaps especially for black women. She did not legally need her son to uh, represent her uh, before the notorial authorities. There was nothing in the Spanish legal code that would have prevented her as a widow from preventing her, presenting her case alone. However, she might have known that having her, sir, her son serve as her proxy, along with three male witnesses, fortified her case as a black woman attempting to secure her rights as a legitimate wife. Perhaps Maria strategically mobilized the collective memory of the pirate attack to her benefit, but what is clear is that she wasn't the only one. With the black population of Veracruz nearly decimated, millions of reales in property lost or damaged, and the city's elite held against their will, who was to blame for such chaos? The Viceroy of New Spain, Dan Tomas de la Cerda, principally accused the infirm governor of Veracruz, Don Pablo Zepeda y Lira, of having arrived unfit to take on the responsibilities of safeguarding the port. In a 1684 letter to King Charles II, the Viceroy asserted, I now realize by that by having Zepeda in command of the city and him not being a soldier allowed for the loss and great damage. Later adding, the gall of the pirates and the enemies of the crown of your majesty also complained a contributing factor. The Viceroy replaced Zapelo with officials with military experience and so confident was he that this newly installed martial government that the Viceroy boldly proclaimed that had such men been chosen in the first place, the sack of the city would have never occurred. The city council also capitalized on the opportunity to exculpate themselves from accusations of their incompetency in port management by calling upon the memory of the great siege. In an August 24th, 1683 letter, so just a few months after the great siege, the council members stated that they were behind in schedule unloading a fleet of ships due to a lack of black laborers and other service people after quote, that fatal event. The great siege seemed to open the door to allow for an array of extenuating circumstances and that a widowed black woman had also been victimized by the same hated pirates who had devastated the lives of thousands in Veracruz just two years prior was perhaps evocative enough for notorial officials to listen more intently as she explained her case. Through the careful selection of her witnesses, one a parish priest, Maria had skillfully orchestrated a narrative that featured her as the grief-stricken protagonist, but one that remained steadfast in her mission to resolve the accusation of illegitimacy. Maria called upon her trusted confidants, her social capital, to refute the slanderous claim that her children were conceived out of wedlock. Maria and her husband, Diego, had established a life of relative privilege for their children. But now Maria had to contend with the possibility that one of her daughters who had been born free was living the nightmare of enslavement, other sordid forms of exploitation or possibly already deceased. Perhaps Jalapa's notary public who was unquestionably a Spanish man and possibly even a slave owner did not empathize with the free black woman standing before him. However, the Spanish priest's invocation of the recent collective memory was one that would have resonated with anyone in the central Veracruz region and likely further afield due to the scale of violence suffered by so many. The narratives of the great siege and its aftermath center people of African descent as indispensable, but important in their worth as chattel in their representation as crown tributaries and in their value as members of the colonial workforce. The loss the city council officials argued was quote, nearly immeasurable, something the black community in Veracruz would have all agreed upon. Maria, a free black woman had called for justice, a justice that validated her as a lawful wife a justice that affirmed the rights of her children, 
and perhaps a justice that recognized Maria as a member of a collective still haunted by their vivid memories of the great siege. She had suffered enough, we can imagine, a notorial assistant thinking as her witnesses appeared one after another to attest to her good religious character and her family's legitimacy. We never get a sense of who initially questioned Maria's marriage. Um, my guess is Doña Luisa. But importantly, Maria did not let such an affront stand. She was wealthier than many others, maintained property in Jalapa and Veracruz. But most importantly in this instance, her social capital, her community, rallied around to protect her economic interests and her reputation. What might have been a gendered strategy of survival, a utilitarian attempt to secure her future, demonstrates the importance of a collective memory for the historically marginalized as they stood before Crown authorities to plead their cases, offer up their family legacies, and defend their humanity. The Great Siege marked time for everyone, but not all in the same way. The case of Maria de la Candelaria, a free and wealthy Black woman, highlights how a regional notorial transaction could quickly become intertwined in the history of traumatic Atlantic affairs. Her case also stresses the continued vulnerability of Black people, regardless of their economic privilege. The abduction of a wealthy daughter of a well-connected, legitimately married, and land-owning parents was a chilling reminder that while capital mattered, the threat of enslavement still loomed and that manumission was not the same as freedom. And never was this more plainly clear than when Black people in slave societies called for justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Terrasas Williams. What a beautiful talk in every way. Um, so I'm looking for questions in the Q&A if anyone in the audience would like to ask any questions. And if you wanna think a moment about them, then I have some questions I've written down because I um, would be very happy to talk more directly of uh, things that I would like to um, hear more about from our, from our guest. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw mine out while the audience warms himself up <laughs> or maybe is processing all that, that fantastic information. Uh, so I had a bunch of different things I was thinking of talking about. Uh, I, I really like the emphasis on different forms of capital and, and how it applies to different, different people within the talk. And I guess I kind of asked my question before the conclusion, which sort of, you sort of answered it that the most um, important um, uh, maybe social capital was probably amongst the most important for, for the main character here. Um, yeah. I don't know, I wonder if you could, uh, I know you touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but I wonder if you could um, broaden that in terms of, how do you think those different forms of capital affect different Afro-Mexican women? You know, just yeah. any other further thoughts on that topic? And I guess Erin um, is asking to stop the screen share. Oh, yep, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There we Great. Go. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole. I think one of the things that um, is central to my research is thinking about how capaciously um, capital was understood. And so while it's quite, it, it's a bit more direct to think of the social capital, her community um, that she actually brought before the notary public, right, that the capital, the social capital that she also mobilized was creating a collective by having someone invoke that memory, right? That it wasn't just her standing before there. In fact, and it wasn't just the, the three witnesses that she brought with her in addition to her son, it's everyone who experienced that was there standing with her, including perhaps as I imagine, the notary public might have had um, an experience with it as well. Um, you know, as I said, that there are, it really reverberated out past just the port of Veracruz and very, um, you, know, you know, people would have had a visceral response even to the invocation. And so I think that um, with regard to social capital, it's the people she brought, but it's also the community that she allowed the notary public to imagine with her. Um, by bringing him in, in it as well. 
And so uh, again, I think capital in this moment was um, both sort of cultural knowing how to, you know, create a line of defense, but also social capital, even, even broader than just the networks, right? That you can actually manifest social capital by invoking something so horrific um, as the 1683 attack. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So in her knowledge of the legal system, we can call that uh, cultural capital. In her display of these people in her favor, we have a public expression of social capital, right? That, yeah. that, that's a super interesting analysis. Um, let's see, my other, and I'm hoping I'll get some questions. Don't be shy, people. <laughs> you pretend you're in a class and, and Professor Tarasis Williams is your professor. And of course, professors are always uh, happy to have questions. Oh, look, we have a question. All right, let's see what we got. Um, oh, this is this is actually, um, so I'm going to say Rhea, this is actually something that was in my mind uh, just now. Uh, this is a, I'm a historian of this period, so I know the answer, but I think it's really good for, for, for the audience to learn a little bit about um, the, the idea of notaries uh, yes. as such a force, because of course that was mentioned a, a ton in the talk and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in some historic fields uh, like ours that we share, uh, this is our, this is our bread and butter and yes. others, it might be like, as of course, as you know, very well. What on earth, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, great question. Very appropriate question. So I let's see. I can't see the question. Um, oh, I, de I deleted. It was just kind of the the idea of how, how and why are notaries so oh so yeah. important. Yeah. Uh, you know, I um, so many years ago, I was really inspired by the work of Catherine Burns at Chapel Hill, um, and her um, thinking through. You know, what does it mean to have this? You know incredibly powerful sort of, you know, they're the arbiters in so many ways um, of civil justice in some, in some ways, you know, they, they create the truth, which is why I think about what does notorial truth look like, you know, and, and not it being actual truth, but just that, but what they wanted to offer. Um, and I think specifically about how um, free black women would have thought about this institution because they often only went before it um, with, uh, they went before it with cases or agreements with Spanish people. Um, and so they were not often, they did sometimes, but not often going to make legal arrangements or um, finalizing deals with other people of African descent. And so what does it mean for a black woman to know that in a place that you know, slavery is still going on, that she's going to need this institution to ensure that her rights are secured in some ways. Um, you know, the notary wasn't perfect. Um, there were definitely a few, a number of cases of, um, in the uh, Jalapa Notorial Archive where people are coming forward and saying, the notary didn't realize that someone else owned this and so now we have to make a correction. This actually happened in one of the cases of the free black women um, that I examine in the larger book. And um, so, but they were seen as the people who had the final word. And so the fact that they had access to this is an incredible um, you know, apparatus that they mobilized and they mobilized it most frequently, I think with people perhaps that they were more concerned about um, making those arrangements with. Very rarely are, um, there's only one case in which a free black woman in the late six, late 17th century who says, I, um, I had made some sort of informal uh, agreements with um, these two Spanish men and they have in their possession sort of proof that we made that agreement. Most other black women are not doing that. Um, they are being very careful about making sure that every arrangement is documented. And um, which is wonderful because it gives all of these amazing histories um, of Black women, but it's not their full histories, right? Someone's business life or civic life is not their full life. Um, but it is a, is a really wonderful uh, place to, to think about um, Black women's history. There are you know, lots of other wonderful scholars who focus on things like the Inquisition cases, um, you know, of course. Um, but I really wanted to steer away from questions of criminality in that way and, and really look at these women as dynamic economic 
actors who were really quite savvy about um, when to use um, this particular institution. Yeah, that that's so true. I mean, it, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, for, for those out there uh, who, who aren't historians of <laughs> Spain and, and Spanish America or Portuguese America as well, you know, the, these are the, the people who, who cover everything from, from slave sales to, to, to smaller sales, dowries, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a paper empire, empire, so it's structured on paper. And um, yeah, what was I gonna say on that? Yeah, and it's interesting that the need to be extra careful, I mean, in a sense is, you know, important. So I'm gonna check the other, or I lose my train of thought too much. Um, so, so yeah, that the student, the, I'm sorry, I'm assuming it's a student. So yeah, the uh, question was just, is there a slightly bro any broader context, you know, about the kind of the history of the, the notarial um, function, any broader context, um, uh, I'll read it again. The more about how the notary's public came to be such a force in obtaining justice in, in Span the Spanish uh, settlement of Mexico. And then I will get to the next question, but yeah, any other broader, yeah, I would say that, you know, the, the notaries were charged with really knowing the communities in which they were stationed, essentially. And so they should know whether, you know, the statements that people are making um, are true, right? Having it verified. And again, so they really do serve as, um, you know, the arbiters of truth in many ways, especially around questions of business. Um, Nicole mentioned um, dowries, but also powers of attorney. You know, how do you get someone to legally represent you? Um, you had to go and issue someone a poder, which is essentially what we would probably call a power of attorney today, um, so that they can conduct business on your behalf. Your last will and testament is notarized. Um, and so I didn't just rely on the notary's, um, you know, documents to, you know, energize the project. And this is one of the things that I found so fascinating about thinking about what the notorial archive can offer us and the parish archive, which I put into conversation. If I only looked at the notorial archive, the story that what I, I would have been offered is that um, Black women are only engaging with Spanish people. That's what I would have gotten. Um, and in reality, when you look at the parish archive, um, black women are marrying black people, <laughs> you know, black men. Uh, they're getting other black women to serve as, you know, they're the godmothers to their children. And so I know that they're having these, you know, um, familiar and intimate relationships with other black people. But when it comes down to business, I think that they're probably informally working with other members of the black community and being really um, careful about when they make deals with Spaniards. Um, so again, if I had only done one, I would have gotten a very different story. And it was just like, well, I, I definitely know they're interacting with one another, but they don't feel that they have to pay a notary to transact business or to finalize deals with black people. And what does that say about their concern about their own place in society and their continued vulnerability, right? That, Again, manumission doesn't mean freedom and it doesn't mean, you know, that people will believe you. Um, and so how do you then offer some protection for you and your own family? Yeah, that's so fascinating because it's the idea, as, as you mentioned before, we, ju we just use the documents. That's all we have, right? Documents. So if it's something that doesn't appear in a document, then we just simply can't know about it. We just don't know. So I was kind of thinking you might say, um, if I only did no notarial records, then I would think all, all people did was business. <laughs> yes, <sorry. laughs> and, and there's no like love or socializing or procreation or whatever. Although of course that's obvious that it's in there too. But you know, it's like it's all business. Uh, but we don't know what kind of oral deals happened, yeah. right? That that are trusted. That's a really interesting point. And that's where our um, excellent Professor Marisa Chappelle. She thought maybe you answered it, but um, yeah, we'll just say, give you the opportunity. Any other sources? I mean, I know you make a really good point, and this is something I tried to do way back in two thousand three. You know, because all I had I had seen was was the Inquisitor.